Order. I call this meeting to order. So this is Standing Committee on Natural Resources and Economic Development. I'm John White. I'm the MLA for Glace Bay Dominion and the new committee chair. Today we, we will hear from presenters regarding the rural economic development recovery after COVID-19. And I ask that you turn your phones off or put them on silent. In case of an emergency, we, en we exit through the Granville Street exit on the left-hand side here when you come in and then we go to Grand Parade to be accounted for. I'll now ask committee members to introduce themselves for the record, starting here with Dave Ritzy. Good afternoon, everyone. Dave Ritzy, MLA for Truro Bible Hill, Melbrook, Salmon River. Hi, folks. Welcome to committee. My name is Kent Smith. I'm the MLA for the Eastern Shore. Good afternoon, everyone. Trevor Woodrow, the MLA for Richmond. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome. My name is Chris Palmer, MLA for Kings West. Lisa LaChance, MLA for Halifax, Little Sable Island. Hi, Gary Burrell, Halifax, Shabakto. Thanks for having Kerr from Annapolis. Uh, Fred Tilly, Northside Westmount. Thank you. And I'll note the presence of Chief Legislative Counsel Gordon Hebb. Thanks for showing up now. <laughs> <laughs> Get the new guy, eh? And Tamara Nusebe for the committee clerk. So the topic is rural economic recovery after COVID-19. And the witnesses, I'd ask you guys to introduce yourselves, if you don't mind. Just, just a short introduction first, and then we'll go back to your opening comments, starting with Mayor Matugo. Thank you, Mr. MLA, and thank you all for the invitation to be here. My, na <clears throat> My name is Amanda McDougall. I am now the past president of the Nova Scotia, Scotia Federation of Municipalities, also mayor of the Cape Breton Regional Municipality. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Emily Lutz. I am the past past president of the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities and the deputy mayor of the municipality of the County of Kings. Uh, thank you, Scott Farmer, Deputy Minister Economic Development. Thanks for the opportunity to join you today. Thank you, Gordon Stevens, uh, COO and VP of Finance at Develop Nova Scotia. Thank you. Uh, now we'll go back for opening comments, starting with Mayor McDougall. So again, thank you. Um, it's interesting, I, when I was putting together my notes on how to speak to economic recovery specific to rural communities uh, post-COVID, um, I don't think we can just talk about COVID alone because we have COVID, we have Fiona, we have the now incredible difficulties around day-to-day -day expenses and affordability uh, of life for residents across Nova Scotia. So in order to talk about recovery, we, we have to really acknowledge that there's so many factors at play. Um, again, my comments will be highlighting some of that complexity um, specific to rural Nova Scotia by focusing on a few areas that I feel um, on behalf of NSFM that will offer residents of Nova Scotia the much needed support they are asking for. And that's really the crux of all of this. We're hearing every single day as elected officials at every level of government of what residents need. And so that's really where uh, my comments will stem from. So one thing I know post COVID I hear a lot about from residents is the need for space, the need for green space, for recreational space, uh, a space to socialize in a safe way that really came to light when you know we were at home in our places of dwelling um, trying to protect one another from COVID once those um, reins loosened a bit and we could go back out into the community a little bit that's when people started to rediscover their neighborhoods and perhaps rediscover that their communities weren't those spaces um, that they thought were welcoming as perhaps uh, they should be. So looking at parks, looking at walking tracks, looking at accessibility into those spaces, um, folks really started to um, prioritize this as a need for our communities. Now. That is all important to have that space, but I think what's important as well is to focus on the impact of that space on people's mental health and physical health as well. So again, this comes back to that complexity that I was talking about in, you know, there's not going to be one way that we can help um, move through recovery, but there's so many different pieces that are so intertwined. 
So those spaces are really important for a number of reasons. Um, those spaces are also um, the reason why a lot of people wanted to come here to Nova Scotia during COVID. And what we saw happen during COVID was a tremendous amount of um, you know, expat Nova Scotians coming back home from out west in Ontario. We also saw people coming from all over the world and purchasing homes, purchasing apartments, purchasing businesses because they knew that this was a safe place to be. When they came here though, um, yeah, initially, you know, the housing market was much different and they bought some really reasonably priced houses. And then they got their tax bill a year later after the cap came off. And let me tell you, the phone lines start ringing. The tax cap really is coming to light again as a really important issue. And if we're going to be talking about economic recovery in our rural communities, we have to acknowledge the deficit and the inequ inequity that the tax cap is putting on people. We're hearing from folks now, um, you know, in our municipal offices saying things like, this was not the taxes that, that, that I signed up for. How come they've now doubled and maybe almost tripled? What is a tax cap? And trying to explain that has been really, um, it, it's, it makes me conscious that we have to keep this on the table when we're talking about economic recovery. Um, if we are going to be doing any type of growing in our communities, we also have to think about those that are most vulnerable. Again, through COVID and now through Fiona and, and the ongoing crisis of cost of day-to-day -day life, the most vulnerable folks are those who are feeling the negative impacts the most. We saw this during COVID when people could not access places like access spaces like food banks um, as frequently as they needed, the social programs that they wanted to attend because they needed to for their own mental health and stability, uh, the resources in terms of uh, programming around addictions and, and mental health support, our most vulnerable were definitely left behind and we can't let that happen again. It is continuing today, like I said, in this crisis of cost for everyday living. So all of this needs to be taken into account if we are going to find solutions uh, as a go forward. Um, I know in my concluding remarks, I will be talking about this, but um, having folks from different levels of government at your com committee today is a wonderful step in the right direction because we know that as municipal elected folks, uh, we rely on expertise and, and support from provincial elected folks and we all together de de depend on our federal colleagues as well. So I will speak a bit more about that collaboration, but I'll hand it over to my, my wonderful colleague, Emily. Thank you, Mayor Dougal. Ms. Lutz? Thank you very much, and thanks, Mayor McDougall. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about uh, some of the same things uh, Mayor McDougall has talked about, but I'm going to get a little bit down into the weeds and uh, maybe even the dirt, so the water and wastewater. So one thing we are dealing with in Kings County particularly, but across the province is just unprecedented levels of growth, of building permits, of applications, where we used to deal with dozens of building permits over a certain time frame, we're now dealing with hundreds. Um, and when municipalities plan for our infrastructure services, we obviously do asset management planning. We are ready for regular levels of growth, anticipated levels of growth. But one thing we did not anticipate, obviously, was COVID. And um, there's only so much you can do uh, with what you have. And so we have infrastructure in the ground that we have been saving for and planning for. Uh, do we have the capacity to manage the growth we are currently facing, I think that is something we're going to require some support with. Um, and I, Kings is not the only municipality in the situation, but we can't talk about growth at all without talking about the services that people require when they get here. And at your tables, I feel like those conversations are often healthcare, often um, social services. Um, at our tables, it's pipes in the ground and it's it's wet water and wastewater because you cannot build uh, a massive uh, five-story apartment building without the capacity to support that being there. And so we want to ensure that we are proper and well-equipped partners at your table, um, that we have the, the, the infrastructure laid in the ground to allow that development to happen. Um, to use Kings County again and as an example, um, we really promote density in our county and we've been doing that since 1973 when we decided that we would make it a priority to protect agricultural land. Uh, we all know that that's very important in today's world, food security, protecting our farmers. So we have taken an active approach of protecting farmland for years in Kings County. What that has done is, is we do try to push urban density, which we, again, we could handle uh, three years ago when we were receiving regular levels of growth, but with what we're, what we're being asked to now provide, um, 
is over and above what we had ever planned for. So a continued investment with the province and partnership with the province is going to be really important uh, going forward. Um, particularly if we're going to talk about doubling our population. Uh, if we're going to say we want to double the population, the second half of that sentence needs to be um, and make sure that we are properly resources, resourced and supporting those people when they get here. Um, and you'll, we hear about housing, and this is, this is a, directly related to housing, um, but it trickles out into other areas. So when we're talking about um, child care, when we're talking about long-term care and the labor shortages in both of those fields, both of which I'm intimately uh, acquainted with as the president of the Bergen District Nursery School and the chair of Grandview Manor uh, Seniors Long-Term Care Home. Uh, we cannot recruit staff to those uh, two facilities because we cannot find places for them to live. And we can, we can make every Atlantic immigration pilot application uh, that we can, but if there's ultimately no place for those people to go, and there's no sewer and water in the ground for us to be able to support uh, new developments when they get here, uh, we have the, the chain is being blocked up. The, 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 the way things should be run, uh, there's, there's barriers along the way. So it's all interrelated. Um, I, I couldn't come here today without talking about how the child care crisis is impacting our employers' abilities to be able to have staff, um, and not to mention the daycares themselves are struggling with staff. So it's one thing leads to another leads to another, and I think that's uh, something that is felt acutely in the city but is felt just as acutely in rural areas of this province. Um, and I'll just uh, conclude my opening comments with the notion that municipalities um, would be better able to tackle these challenges if we had uh, better economies of scale. Um, scale would allow local government to properly resource operations and be more effective partners. Um, structural change should be considered as a part of regionalization if you want to allow municipalities to be meaningful partners in conversations. Uh, we should include the idea of regionalization, the idea of working together as part of forthcoming municipal modernization and renegotiation conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lutz. Deputy Minister Farmer. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to be here to contribute to today's discussion and share what our department is doing uh, to support rural economic recovery after COVID-19. As a province, our commitment to following public health directives during the pandemic allowed us to withstand the impacts of COVID-19 better than many jurisdictions. This was reflected in our economic recovery coming out of the pandemic where Nova Scotia had a smaller economic contraction in 2020 and stronger growth in 2021 than most provinces. In 2021, Nova Scotia's real GDP grew by 6.2% and our population increased 2.9%, surpassing 1 million people. Despite the positive outcomes, we know it's been a challenging time for many Nova Scotia businesses. Throughout the pandemic, the Department of Economic Development's priority has been to support the business sector and emerge from the pandemic as strongly as possible. This required all three levels of government to work together to respond, and the provincial approach was to complement federal programming and fill gaps where needed. By collaborating with the business community, our department was able to introduce several support programs, including the Small Business Impact Grant Program. There were three rounds of that the Sector Impact Support Program and the Targeted Sector Impact Program, among many others, to help businesses navigate the impacts of COVID-19. As we move forward, our department continues to focus on creating the conditions for businesses to thrive and building an economy where all Nova Scotians can participate, contribute, and benefit. As part of this, we've been engaging with business owners, entrepreneurs, and community leaders across the province to get their feedback and hear their ideas on how we can grow our economy. A clear theme has emerged from these conversations is that Nova Scotia has a great track record for innovation. That's why this past year, the Innovation Rebate Program was made a permanent ongoing program with a $12 million annual funding commitment. It's important to acknowledge that about 75% of these approved innovation rebates are outside of HRM. The Innovation Rebate Program has seen exceptional uptake and success in rural communities with current projects in nine different regions across the province. The program is a great example of government and business sector working together to address some of our most complex challenges. And it's this type of collaboration that will help drive our economic growth here in Nova Scotia. 
Thank you for the opportunity to say a few words. I look forward to sharing more about the other programs that are in place uh, through the discussion this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mr. Farmer. Uh, Mr. Luke, or Stevens, sorry, Mr. Stevens. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before the committee. Uh, in 2018, Develop Nova Scotia was created uh, from the, um, uh, our, our predecessor company, Waterfront Development, and through that creation, our mandate was expanded to include all of Nova Scotia. This gave us the opportunity to extend the lessons and knowledge gained from creating economic opportunities in Halifax and Lunenburg uh, to other rural communities in the province. Today, our team is working on with more than 25 separate communities throughout the province from Yarmouth to Meek Cove, uh, and close to 40 projects to create economic and community infrastructure have been completed or are underway. During COVID, we used the lull in visitation and activity to complete over $40 million in infrastructure stimulus projects. The result of these investments are now being felt throughout the province as we see tourism ramp up this past year and more and more locals are out to venture uh, and enjoy the public spaces. Investments in improved infrastructure and new shared facilities uh, at the Smith and Ruland Shipyard in Lunenburg, creating opportunities for the Ocean Gear and Old Town Boat Works, as well as supporting the marine services sector overall. Most of you would have seen significant investments in Peggy's Cove, uh, welcoming that, that now allows us to welcome cruise ship passengers back, uh, as well as an intense increase in the number of locals who are visiting there. Local businesses are reporting very good seasonal results uh, and we've enabled two smaller businesses to set up in Peggy's Cove. New floating infrastructure in Bedeck has facilitated a 23% increase in overnight marine traffic in its first year of full operations. Revitalization of the foundation wharves in Halifax uh, has seen our pedestrian counts uh, spike to 3 million people this year. The previous high uh, in 2019 was 2 million, so we're well beyond where we were pre-COVID. Uh, that's related, resulting in most of our tenants experiencing record sales. The Halifax and Lunenburg waterfronts uh, are hosting 161 days of events and activations this year, and we know that active program public spaces help to attract people to visit and to stay. Approximately $7 million of funds was directed to the Nova, Nova Scotia COVID Response Council, earmarked uh, to fund a variety of projects under our thriving communities focus. These community-led projects create new public spaces and economic infrastructure for uh, approximately $1 million. Our team is working with dozens of community organizations and municipalities on 20 separate community-led projects. Each of those projects received $50,000 uh, directly from the fund, an additional $460,000 uh, of funding was leveraged through other sources. Communities have created great places where locals can gather, which give yet another reason for visitors to come calling. From outdoor library spaces to seating, lighting, outdoor spaces to pocket patios to movable parks, play structures, expanding local farmers markets and town squares, they all provide an opportunity to attract more people and to create economic impact. Other projects underway and funded through the COVID Response Council include the Lewisburg Visitor Experience Centre, uh, Picto Waterfront Project, the Evergreen Festival uh, in 2020 and 2021 and about to kick off this week for 2022. Uh, the Inverness Growth Strategy and Complete Streets Projects, and we're working with uh, the Africville Heritage Society on the Africville Marina Project. We also continue to advance the important work of extending high-speed internet across Nova Scotia. In 2018, when we started, there were 102,000 homes and businesses identified as unserved or underserved, putting Nova Scotia at about 75% coverage. Today, we have projects underway or completed to reach 98,500 of those people uh, by the end of 2023 and early 2024. That will get us to 99.1% coverage. Completion of the Pictou County's independent project should bring our province to close to 100% coverage. Every day, we reach more. Uh, we know that it's not fast enough, but through careful monitoring uh, and management of our partners, we're making progress uh, every month. Uh, and as of uh, October 2022, we've reached 72,500 of those 102,000 homes. The Develop Nova Scotia team will soon join Nova Scotia lands to become the Build Nova Scotia team, and we consider it a privilege to, leave the to have the opportunity to work in partnership with so many communi communities across Nova Scotia. 
We're passionate about getting behind communities and helping them to uncover opportunities for new or improved public spaces, working waterfronts, and different types of economic infrastructure. I look forward to addressing any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, witnesses, some excellent remarks. Uh, before we begin, just a reminder that when just a reminder that when we do begin questioning, uh, I have to say your name to recognize you so that your, t your microphone can come on and turn red so you know everybody to speak. We've agreed to open up uh, to end questioning at 2.35 today. So when it reaches that mark, I will just simply interrupt you and say order, please. Uh, at that time, I'd ask you for a brief comments to close so we can finish. We have a lot of business to do today before we finish up. So the floor is open for questions. LaShance, I think you had your name, hand up first. Emily LaShance. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you all for being here. And actually, I have a ton of questions, but so I'll try to keep my preambles as short as possible. Um, you know, on one hand, I heard from um, Mayor McDougall and Deputy Mayor Lutz about, uh, you know, some of the challenges around like labor shortage, but that's related to housing, which then is linked to services. So I definitely get that there's sort of a whole, there's a whole system there. Um, and then on this side, you know, some of the, the great projects that have been done, um, I guess I'm wondering um, together, like if, if, if there were challenges with finding labor for the projects that you have been able to fund, um, if you're hearing from your counterparts um, in rural areas about the challenge of, um, uh, you know, of the labor shortage that is linked, linked, linked. Um, and has there been a discussion together in terms of what some of those solutions might be that might be able to come through the department? So I don't know who wants to start. But <laughs> Deputy Minister Farmer. <clears throat> Thank you. And, and um, as it relates to labor shortages, it, it's something that we hear across the province. Um, the most recent data on labor shortages shows most industries are in a area of you know four to six percent vacancies uh, an exception to that is in the um, food service and accommodations where it's higher it's more like nine percent vacancy rate so across the board whether it's by industry or by geography access to labor is a is a challenge I think the most recent data had us at about 23,000 vacancies in the in the province uh, interestingly, uh, the most recent EI data had us at about 23,000 uh, employment insurance uh, recipients. So there's a mismatch that exists between the, the, the skills and, and um, uh, jobs that are in demand and, and you know, some of the people who, who are um, uh, not employed in the province with an you know, unemployment rate currently around 6.5% in the province but as we as we talk to businesses as we travel the province it's a recurring theme around uh, labor shortages um, part of it is a, a demographic impact in the province quite frankly we've got this aging population and people age out of the out of the workforce it's why it's so important that we grow our population we grow our population with young people and that we use our immigration streams to fill the necessary uh, gaps that exist in the uh, in the economy today. So, working with our colleagues at Labor Skills and Immigration, there's a there's a priority on those jobs that are most in demand uh, through the through the immigration streams to help address some of those gaps in the province. Mayor McDougall, um, <clears throat> from a municipal point of view, um, when we are hearing from businesses and organizations that they simply cannot bring people in because there is no housing, we've started thinking from, and I'm, I'm going to speak from a CBRM perspective, um, what do we have that can help alleviate this problem? So taking a look at, for example, our surplus lands that we have in the Cape Breton Regional Municipality and saying, okay, of these lands, um, what what properties could potentially be used for good development, so dense development that can happen. And it does not need to be in the urban core. This is throughout the entire municipality. So where are the pieces of property that are already on um, municipally serviced um, properties, and how do we get it out there? So I'll also use the example of 
uh, CBRM's waterfront uh, property, so pretty significant piece of property, um, put it back out there for RFP, clearly stating we need more densified housing opportunities uh, in the CBRM. So bring us the commercial opportunity, but also make sure and incorporate that residential piece as well. So I think you're going to see more and more municipalities across Nova Scotia, and I'm thinking of, for example, Antigonish, you know, coming together and creating dignified affordable housing products but all possibilities but also thinking okay how do we use our assets to increase housing stock across the board um it's something that municipalities are not necessary necessarily um, resourced or skilled in but we're at the point that again that cost crisis of everyday life is so extreme that we need to figure out our role in it and when i say that i think it's also very important to say okay how do we make sure that municipalities are at those tables um, where potential funding opportunities are coming up and how do we make sure that not only is it municipal and provincial municipal provincial federal folks all together talking about things like rapid housing talking about potential funds going forward changes in legislation we all need to be at that table together because going at this on our own is simply not it's it's just not sustainable thank you uh, miss Lutz. Thank you, and I would also add to that there's a responsibility, there is a direct responsibility, or there's a direct responsibility municipalities have that can address the housing crisis through our municipal planning strategies, and particularly municipalities who've had experience doing land use planning for years and years and years have a, a, a great understanding of how their community is organized and, and what the barriers might be to housing. So earlier I spoke about larger developments in more urban centers and the, the the services required to have those developments be successful, um, but we also have committed to re-examining our land use plan to look at backyard suites, to look at increasing density in the places we have, um, because again, the more development that we can encourage where we where it's already serviced, um, of course, we save money. The more people that are using those services that are there, there's more people paying for them. So we obviously are encouraging that, and it's less people that that feel the need or or the desire to build out potentially on a valuable agricultural land. So there are things we can do at a, at a municipal level to encourage that housing piece, which is looking at our own municipal plans, um, trying to find some flexibility while also in encouraging density. But again, backfilling that density with all those services is, is top of mind. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Emily Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you once again to the witnesses for being here today. Uh, I have a question for Deputy Minister Farmer. Uh, I love every opportunity that I get to talk about and promote Sheet Harbor, uh, in particular the port of Sheet Harbor. Um, and of course, at the beginning of the pandemic, there wasn't much activity going on there. And in the middle of the pandemic, we were able to put an RFP out and hire a new port operator. Uh, and in conjunction with that, the folks at NSBI have been working diligently to try and become a player in the offshore wind sector. So I'm wondering if you can share the latest developments and, and what might be on the horizon for my hometown. Deputy Minister Kerr, Farmer, sorry. Deputy thank, Minister Farmer. Thank you. And uh, I, I share your optimism for the for the Port of Sheet Harbor. Um, there is a uh, an oncoming boom in offshore wind. Uh, uh, on the eastern seaboard of the United States, uh, there's going to be dramatic growth over the coming years. And we anticipate that there's going to be dramatic growth in Nova Scotia uh, over the coming years. A lot of the providers today, because it's much more established in Europe, are European uh, providers who would look for staging areas in, in North America as part of projects if they are the, you know, if they're the proponent. Um, and, and they are the successful proponent in a number of uh, the US, uh, U.S. projects. So, so longer term, we see a tremendous opportunity for Port of Sheet Harbor, other ports in uh, Nova Scotia, to be a part of that uh, supply chain. And in fact, we purchased property at the Port of Sheet Harbor to enable the large laydown areas that would be necessary for, uh, for that kind of uh, uh, for that kind of an opportunity and we're going through the necessary permitting uh, processes right now with with NSBI <clears throat> but of course those are those are longer term uh, opportunities uh, the the new operator there is Quebec uh, Stevedoring Limited 
and uh, they've been in place since February of, of 2022, and they've been a very active uh, manager of the facility uh, there uh, since they've taken over. Um, we're, we're looking at two and a half to three times the vessel traffic that has historically uh, been there and they're making capital investments to, to upgrade the, the port. So we're on a very good trajectory there, uh, but there's a, a really significant opportunity in the offshore wind space that uh, we, we hope is uh, ahead of us as well. Thank you, MLA Kerr. This question is for Deputy Minister uh, Farmer. And I appreciate your comments made in 2021. There was a GDP growth of 6.2% through the year, and there was 2.9% population growth. Certainly appreciate the current government uh, continuing with impact, impact grants and uh, sector grants. What we don't appreciate is uh, the removal of the uh, Economic Sector Council last September. And uh, there seems to be no plan for an economic, economic growth recovery plan, a long-term plan. And I think in 2021, the Auditor General had referenced uh, PEI, New Brunswick, Alberta, BC as having long-term economic recovery plans. Why don't we have an economic recovery plan here in the province? Deputy so, Minister Farmer. Um, so uh, thank you, thank you for the question, and uh, I, I know that the question's been put to the, the minister uh, previously in, in the House. I think if you look at the elements that exist in the various ministers' mandate letters, including the Minister of Economic Development, you see a number of initiatives that uh, if you cut and paste them all into one place, you'd, you'd have uh, something called an economic uh, recovery plan. Uh, our performance uh, has has been significant. 6.2% uh, percent GDP growth is the largest we've had since 1984. Uh, we've never had population growth at the at the level that we've had. We've had really historic low uh, unemployment. So, uh, when you look at the the stats can numbers, uh, the, the progress is good. If if I were to step back and and say. You know, thematically, what are what are the things that we're doing uh, to help uh, drive long-term economic growth? One is around growing the top end of, of our economy, the highest-paying, most productive uh, jobs. We've attracted uh, over 2,000 ICT jobs in the last uh, in the last year uh, to the province. We're uh, taking steps to grow green hydrogen, which we know is going to be a valuable strategic and and well-paying um, industry uh, for the province. We've expanded uh, the presence of uh, IBM and, and others uh, here in the province. So, so sort of growing those top high-paying jobs is, is important. It's also important to help every sector become more productive. Uh, so whether it's the tourism sector having a longer season or it's the manufacturing sector being able to invest in, in productivity, helping every sector to become more productive is an important part of it. Planting the seeds for growth uh, tomorrow through our innovation ecosystem, whether that's investments that we have in Cove, Ignite, Volta, the Verschuren Center, and, and others, is helping us establish the economy that we'll have in 5, 10, 15, and, and 20 years, and then making sure that we're spreading the benefit across the province so that every community is, is benefiting from the prosperity uh, that uh, that we've seen is is an important part of it as also. So I would wrap it up in in, in those terms, but I, I think that it's reflected in the in the mandate letters taken together. Thank you, uh, MLA Budrow. Thank thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you again for everybody. Uh, I've, I have a number of questions, but I'll kind of start with my first one, and I think there's a couple of you who probably want to kind of answer on it. Um, probably M Mayor McDougall and maybe uh, Deputy Minister. Um, uh, farmer, but CBRM has benefited from a number of uh, infrastructure investments recently, like the regional hospital, emergency department, the cancer center, and the new cath lab. Um, what do large infrastructure projects mean uh, for rural economic growth? And CBRM, while we talk about it, sometimes the city has a lot of that rural, uh, you know, that rural piece as well. Mayor McDougall. Mr. Chair, um, so I often <clears throat> use the story of when I was expecting my youngest, um, my husband, who is a plumber, um, he said to me, okay, well, you don't get maternity leave, so what are we going to do? And I said, well, that's okay. It's going to be the slow season. Um, you'll probably get laid off because um, that's what happens in the wintertime in the trades. Well, the winter came, and he did not get laid off. 
so the investments that took place in CBRM in terms of our health care uh, redevelopment, the hub in New Waterford, for example, all of that has created tremendous opportunity for our trades. And, you know, I work really closely with our trade union folks, and there's no shortage in sight of jobs. What there is a shortage of is people being able to work on those job sites so we can have the men and women there come home for supper every single day instead of working 16, 18, 20 hours. Um, it's had a great great impact on our community. Not only are we getting uh, excited about the services being enhanced, but it's creating <clears throat> job opportunity that is now 10 years out. People don't have to think about potentially going out west to go and use their trades. They can do that at home. Um, that being said, I think it's incredibly, incredibly important that we talk about housing at every opportunity. So with all of these wonderful investments, we have more people in the area. We have people traveling here. We have people staying in hotels rather than apartments, which means during tourism season, rooms aren't as available. So it really all comes back to housing and making sure that while we're making these investments, these really, really important investments in all of our services, that there's equal focus and priority put on to, okay, how do we increase housing? Um, because, we, we, yeah, if we don't have roofs for people to go to sleep in every single night after they're done their job, how can they do their jobs? Thank you. Emily Tilly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to the committee for being here today, or so the witnesses for being here today. We had no choice, the committee. <laughs> um, so uh, to Deputy Farmer, it was, um, it, you know, 6.2% growth in 2021. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a good number. Um, but when I, we dig into the budget documents that were presented last spring, um, the budget actually indicates that we're headed for recession around 2024. And uh, we think that probably will be a little sooner than that. So um, right now we don't, so I think that plan that, that we're missing would be um, needed to be updated to, to make sure that we're able to sustain um, through the recession that's headed. But that's not my question. I just wanted to kind of bring that out that we had great growth in 2021, but it looks like we're headed for a recession. Um, what I want to chat about is the Nova Scotia Loyal Program. So um, we've asked the minister uh, multiple times in the, in the legislature about an update on, on Nova Scotia Loyal. And we're seeing uh, at, at her last um, question period, I think somewhere in the, the range of 672,000 has been spent on Nova Scotia Loyal. And I'm assuming that that's significantly more now since the legislature has closed. Um, the minister called that modest spending and we, we heard um, Mayor McDougall and uh, Councillor Lutz talk about um, the crisis of the cost of living. So I guess my question is, where do we see Nova Scotia loyal uh, in helping businesses and consumers with the current cost of living crisis that we're in today? Deputy Minister Farmer, wasn't it? Yeah. Deputy Minister Farmer. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so. As it relates to impacts on businesses and, and consumers uh, in Nova Scotia, we've learned a lot as we've gone through the prototyping and engagement work that, that's happened through the summer and, and continues. Uh, I was at the Mass Town Market uh, the day that uh, the, the launch happened and, and talking with the local farmer and um, his take on it was that um, you know this has the this has the potential to be really impactful uh, for uh, farmers in the province, for small businesses uh, in the province uh, who have an extra an incentive uh, to to buy local. Um, at times of the year, uh, local products are abundant and and they're the the most cost effective thing on the shelf. At other times of the year. They're just simply not available. You won't get a Nova Scotia strawberry uh, in January. So how do we help people to think about buying the Nova Scotian frozen blueberry uh, in January versus buying the California strawberries when, when that comes around? So uh, we can have an impact for, for local producers, certainly, uh, through the program. Uh, and for, uh, for individuals, uh, 
to have some benefit that goes with buying local makes makes uh, the product that they buy just that little much more uh, affordable if, if they're getting some benefit that goes along uh, with it. But it is not a broad-based affordability uh, program. It's really meant to drive demand for uh, local products in the long term to the benefit of uh, Nova Scotia producers and the spin-off benefits that then come from that. MLA Palmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is uh, a great conversation we're having this afternoon and a great topic, uh, rural economic recovery, uh, a passion of mine. And my question, uh, I think, would probably be for a deputy farmer uh, or anybody that would be uh, interested in answering. Um, you had mentioned in your intro remarks about the uh, innovation rebate program and uh, an existing program that maybe had some enhancements or things happen with it uh, different over the last year. Um, and uh, back in October, Scotian Gold, a, uh, a large employer in the Kings County uh, in the uh, agriculture and fruit growing business that uh, Ms. Lutz would be familiar with, um, it uh, received some funding through that program. And as part of the work, they're estimating that they'll save around 4 million litres of water per year. Um, so I guess my question is two part. Could you maybe elaborate on the innovation rebate program in general? And uh, maybe tell us a little bit how uh, economic development and sustainability uh, go hand in hand uh, as you see it, please. Okay. Deputy Minister Farmer. Thank you, Thank you uh, very much. And um, for a, a period of time uh, through the fall, I was Deputy Minister of Economic Development and Deputy Minister of Environment and Climate Change uh, at, at the same time. And people often said to me, well, you must run into an awful lot of conflicts. Uh, with those two portfolios, and that may have been true at one time. I think that uh, we're, we're in a time where they dovetail uh, very much. Uh, ultimately, what is good from an environment and climate change perspective is good business uh, over the long term. And in fact, <clears throat> we see that with a, a lot of businesses, whether they are far down the line in the ultimate consumer or they're supplying into a supply chain, there's an expectation that they're going to be uh, changing. They're going to be reducing their greenhouse uh, gas emissions. They're going to be using more sustainable uh, products. So um, there's there's a, a very nice synergy that exists between what's good from an environment perspective and, and what's good from an economic development perspective. Uh, with respect to IRP in particular, it's a, it's a program that had existed as a pilot for a, a three-year period. It was tremendously uh, successful. Uh, it uh, the, the format of it is it's a 25% uh, rebate on capital investments under $15 million. Over $15 million, there's a separate capital investment tax credit that comes into play. Uh, so it helps businesses make invest capital investments anywhere from $350,000 up to $15 million. It offsets the cost by 25% as a rebate if they meet certain uh, criteria. Uh, the program was made permanent uh, this year and the uh, criteria were, were modified to include uh, investments in sustainability. So where it had been primarily focused on productivity, it's now broader and focused to focus on uh, productivity and sustainability. The Scotian Gold example is, a, is an excellent one. Uh, Acadian Sea Plants has been a, a recipient. Um, and by virtue of, of their approved product project, they anticipate reducing landfill waste by 180,000 uh, kilograms um, and uh, gaining 15% more yield uh, in the process. Maritime Labels, another recipient, uh, has reduced their print waste by 35%. Uh, Oil and Breweries is capturing 75 to 90% of the CO2 that was previously waste is going back into their, uh, their processes. And there's any number of examples <clears throat> that uh, that fit this description. So uh, we've been uh, very pleased with the uh, the uptake on the IRP uh, program uh, and the projects that have been funded have been 75% outside of uh, HRM. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lutz. Thank you very much. I just, uh, Deputy Farmer, sparked my, my mind into something and the idea of innovation and, and energy and sustainability. And I think we can apply the idea of innovation and alternative ways of doing things as well to our own regulations and our own relationship that the province has with Nova Scotia Power. Um, so there are published reports that say we cannot uh, decarbonize or reach net zero without local 
regional energy production. Our municipality has been working in a partnership with Glues Cap First Nation and Annapolis Valley First Nation for months, if not years. Um, something that came across my desk for the first time in 2017 in my role as deputy mayor with the county and we've been working on since to create a large scale solar facility um, in outside Kempville in a community of Meadowview, which was historically um, a marginalized community where a, a dump was located, um, an example of environmental racism in that community and um, it's currently a brownfield site and is the perfect place to put in large scale solar generation. But we consistently run into barriers with power purchase agreements. And that is something that is in legislation that the province has the ability to change and amend. Um, that is a huge barrier to our ability to enter into that relationship with our two First Nations partners. It's a wonderful project. Um, it's taken incredibly, an incredibly long time. And this the final piece of this puzzle, the power purchase agreements, uh, seems a relatively minor piece of the entire thing for us to be able to get across the finish line on that project. So um, there is ability for municipalities to be meaningful partners on climate change and also to generate revenue for our municipalities. Um, we don't always have to go to the taxpayer to get revenue as municipal units. There are other ways we can generate revenue to do things uh, like invest in water and wastewater to address housing, to address labor shortages. Um, so green energy is one of those really... Um, under under tapped resources, I think that we can look at for economic development, not just for local businesses, um, but also for local municipalities to then be able to provide more services, address the basics, but also the things that Deputy Farmer talked about a little bit in his opening remarks as well, around quality of life, quality of living in our communities, public spaces, that type of thing, uh, that certainly could use some investment in rural areas. But there is a missed opportunity there, and the barrier is right there at the Nova Scotia Power level and it can be addressed through the legislation. Um, so I would leave that in your hands. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Emily Burrell. Uh, I hope you're enjoying that the construction pounding is eased up. But don't, don't relax. It's time to start again. Yeah, we're used to it. <laughs> uh, look, I, uh, Mr. Stevens, I, I wonder if we could f uh, focus a little bit on the rural internet uh, question. Always when we're talking about uh, economic development, uh, outside of the urban part of the HRM, of course, all, the, the availability of high-speed internet. This, this is the, this is the, the one of the key questions. And and uh, one of the things ab about uh, internet that's so problematic for us, uh, not just in Nova Scotia but in the, in the whole country, is, is is price. And this this has come uh, this has come into uh, 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 a great, greater focus, I think, during the whole. Uh, uh, affordability crisis that uh, that we're living in in general of, of the cost of living and we know that uh, you know in Canada in general this is um, this is related to corporate concentration in the sector um, so you, you know people uh, is a concern that uh, uh, a couple of the uh, approved companies that we've been working with have been overtaken by Rogers in the course of the last year uh, and so in 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 light of that uh, is there a um, is it time, uh, in your view, that the, that the province needs to look at really addressing uh, the affordability, the, the, the price point of, of rural internet as a part of getting serious about making uh, uh, high-speed internet available all across the province? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stevens. Thank you. Um, so our, our, our mandate was to deliver access. Um, and one of the um, one of the key things that we insisted on in our contracts was that the price for all Nova Scotians is the same. So even though it's you know, it, may, it may be exceptionally expensive to reach somebody in rural Nova Scotia, um, you know our program funded that market failure. Um, but as part of our service delivery agreements, we tied the cost the, to the consumer of internet. In, in any of our funded projects to what exists in the urban core. Um, that doesn't address your question, except to say that whatever happens in the core will now filter through to the rest of the province. The, the issue of affordability is certainly one that we've heard, um, and you know, it, it comes up frequently. Uh, it's, 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 not, uh, it's not in our current mandate to address that. Uh, again, the, 
the, the most significant issue for many Nova Scotians was there was simply no access to uh, high speed internet at any cost. Um, the but the pricing is something that's being uh, you know the CRTC is involved there. The federal government is involved in initiatives to uh, address the cost of telecommunications, uh, not only internet but also cell for services as well. Um, you know, so I think from from our perspective. Ensuring that that enabling infrastructure is in place is is our primary goal right now, uh, and certainly the funding that was um, earmarked for the Internet Trust was was specifically related to the infrastructure and not to address the cost. Emily Burl, thank you. Um, yes, th thank you. Um, but as the access matter gets to the middle high nineties. Uh, and we move into a kind of a different world about that. The access conversation is changing. W would you agree uh, that the, the affordability and price uh, question uh, is, has an increasing claim on, on the government's attention? Mr. Stevens. Um, again, the, the, the affordability is being addressed uh, at the federal level. Um, and rather than uh, sort of recreate the wheel, um, you know, I would think that the, the prudent thing is to see that process through um, and, uh, and, you know, again, ensure that what we are doing is, is making uh, the, the infrastructure available for access. Emily Lachance. Thank you. Um, I wanted to um, invite Mayor McDougall and Ms. Lutz to spend some time talking a bit more about what you're seeing in terms of the cost of living crisis. So obviously housing, although access to housing is an issue, um, so how else are you seeing this? And, um, you know, and specifically wondering, you know, are, are there any provincial avenues or programs that you're seeing that could offer um, some support? and? Um, whether or not you could also comment on the role of minimum wage in that cost of living crisis. Ms. Lutz, you want to go first? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so it's a persistent and pervasive issue that we're seeing right now. Um, and on the ground level, we are seeing uh, increased usage of food banks, of course. Um, if anyone was present at the um, Nova Scotia Volunteer Ceremony, uh, recognition ceremony, we have a group in the Valley called the Annapolis Valley Frugal Moms Society. And the spearheader, or one of the spearheaders of that group was, was honored as a volunteer of the year. Um, and I consistently follow on that page. And I am consistently shocked about um, the amount of people sleeping in their cars, looking for warm sleeping bags, um, looking for uh, food vouchers, uh, there's, they've created a wonderful community there of, of sharing. Um, but I think a big, a big part of it is food. I mean, lettuce seems to be on everyone's mind these days, um, that you either can't find it or it's $11 a head. Um, so certainly food insecurity is a huge issue. Uh, we are lucky in the Valley to be to be from a farming community, but at this point in the season, generally we're, we're out of the season of abundance and into the season of storage. Um, so we, we, the the more more that the province can do, I think, just to support the people that are food insecure. Um, I'm a huge advocate for school food programs. That doesn't that I mean that helps you know the foundation of our society, the children, of course. Um, I believe we should have hot lunch programs in every single school. Um, my children attend Berwick and District School where they have a pay what you can lunch program. So any child gets a hot lunch regardless of whether or not they can pay for it in a non-stigmatizing manner. That's extremely effective way to get children lunch without pointing out that they may not have brought one themselves or they may not be able to afford the $5 because lunch school lunches have gone up just like everything else. So it's an additional pressure on parents. Um, that program is not funded by the government. That program is funded through parent fundraising. Uh, another thing I have noticed uh, is that people are not able to fundraise as much as they could because they're working two jobs, they're tired, they're picking up the slack in the labor crisis, they're picking up extra shifts because there's... So people are really stretched. I spend a lot of my time in nonprofit spaces doing fundraising and, and volunteering, and the burden is increasingly falling to a fewer and fewer number of people 
whether it's because people lack the time or the resources to volunteer, but I will tell you that those who are still at the table volunteering are getting pretty burnt out. Um, so, I mean, affordable lunch program would be something that I think would be wonderful um, and would relieve the burden on some parents who are currently working at 110% to provide that, that type of service. And I think that can be extended um, beyond schools and, and to those other groups that are providing lunches for other folks in society who, who need them. Um, the minimum wage piece, I think, is an interesting one. Um, I don't know how people survive on minimum wage. I really don't. I hear from people who can't, and it increases their reliance on other services like healthcare, on social services, because they are actively burnt out trying to make ends meet uh, through two or three jobs on that wage. So I do believe a, a higher minimum wage would be of assistance, uh, certainly to folks who are struggling the most in society, but it's also, it's, it's not gonna, it's not gonna fix it. And even if the more it goes up, I mean, I don't know how it could possibly keep pace with the cost of living. So there's somewhere, maybe it has to meet in the middle, but the more programs, more support for programs, absolutely in a higher minimum wage would, I think, be a short-term solution for what seems to be a sort of systemic long-term crunch that's happening right now. Thank you, and Mayor McDougall. So I'm so glad that you spoke to the need for um, food, food as a priority, food specifically for our younger generations. But I think the government has an opportunity as well to focus on seniors in our communities. Um, <clears throat> we're hearing a lot in my office from seniors anticipating the cold weather with fear, great fear, saying, you know, I hardly have enough money to put gas in my car, go to the grocery store to get the bare minimum of food, but this leaves me nothing for heat, for electricity. And so I know from the municipal point of view, um, <clears throat> during our budget last year, we increased our threshold um, of who can apply for the low income tax rebate program. And I know it's not a tremendous amount of money, but <clears throat> excuse me, $300 coming back into the pockets of, of, of CBRM residents is very significant. And so, looking at rebate programs that are available right now, bumping up thresholds of who is eligible to apply, and also increasing the amount that people are receiving um, comparatively to what the cost of life is, um, needs to happen not on an annual basis, but on a rolling basis continually. When we see when we see those price, you know, we have the oil trucks with the price of fuel on them driving through the community, and it's, it's almost heartbreaking in a sense because that's just a sign saying you're not going to be able to afford to stay warm this winter. And so I think all of us working together on our rebate programs, our support programs, and increasing that availability to residents in need and how much they get is very, very important right now. Uh, Emily Tilly. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you to Mayor McDougall and uh, Councillor Lutz um, for bringing attention to um, the issues that we're facing in our community. And while the $300 doesn't seem like much, um, our office, um, and I'm sure um, MLA White's office, uh, are so busy right now filling out forms for seniors to access the grants that are available to access the property tax rebates. And I think it's very important that we do take a look at um, raising those thresholds. And I, uh, one example of that was a, with the emergency home repair grant. Uh, moving that for CBRM to 47.5 made a huge difference in the community with regards to people being able to access um, those grants. And I think we can even go further with those. Um, and also with the senior care grant. Um, so in the past, what we've seen is there's always been a struggling segment of our community. So people that are always struggling, but with the current uh, crisis of cost, and I love that term, that we're, we're seeing today is so many more people are struggling. So people that are um, just on that brink of paycheck to paycheck, now the paycheck is not covering their full extent of their, of their needs. Um, all of that being said, um, my, my question is around the idea of uh, immediate help for 
um, residents of Nova Scotia. So uh, in our session, we, we asked about dropping the gas tax, mode of fuel tax by 50%, which would put money back in people's pockets. We asked about um, uh, what other provinces have done to put a few hundred dollars um, in the pockets of Nova Scotians. And, and the answer that we get back is around the fact that, well, if we give everybody $500, we're just going to increase inflation. And I disagree with that notion, given the fact that people are not going to take that $500 and just go out and spend it on things. They're going to spend it on necessities. They're going to spend it on food, and they're going to spend it on their oil tank. Um, so I guess I'm going to come back to Nova Scotia Loyal. Um, we've spent $672,000 approximately, likely closer to a million now. Um, just wondering if we could get a, and I know there's, you know, I mean, I'm tr trying not to be too petty with this, but when I see our, our province struggling and people struggling, and I see us investing in things like two trucks that are wrapped, and we don't know why, and, you know, the cost of those two trucks being wrapped is at least a couple hundred thousand. They're probably eighty to $90,000 trucks. Um, can we get an update on, and, and uh, Deputy... Um, a farmer indicated that it's not an affordability program, but I would argue that it's actually going to be uh, on the opposite side and driving cost up for business and driving cost up for consumers. So can we get an update um, as to what we spent the 600 and change on and what future benefits um, the province is going to see uh, from this investment? Thank you. Deputy Minister Farmer. Thank you. So. I don't have the, the, the detailed uh, breakdown in front of me, but uh, I can talk about the, the categories. Uh, I think just for clarity, it's it's probably much closer to the 670 than it is to a million. Right now, there wouldn't have been a, a lot that was incurred uh, since that number was uh, was reported. So um, there's a there, there's a prototyping uh, exercise that's uh, that's gone on, uh, working with um, professional services firm Davis Peer where uh, there were engagements at farmers markets, small and large retailers uh, through the province, working on <clears throat> various uh, incentive uh, models and, and testing the, the consumer behavior impacts of those. Uh, there was a, uh, a brand engagement exercise that took place through the summer, and the trucks are, are, are connected to that. but. Um, exploring with Nova Scotians what buying local means to them, why is it important, uh, what are the features of, of a local program that are important to them. So all of this has gone into uh, and some social media that you, you, you would have seen. All of this has gone into the design of the program and, and because it's, it's meant to be uh, a program that's going to last a long time and, and uh, has a uh, substantial impact, we want to make sure that it's designed carefully uh, and with the input of Nova Scotians. Uh, ultimately, when it's fully operational, our expectation would be that it would drive increased demand for uh, local products. The, uh, the, the goal is 10% shift in demand for local products and then the spin-off benefits that uh, accrue from, from that, which would be multiples of the uh, expense that we've uh, seen to date. I should mention as well, in addition to uh, you know the consumer-oriented focus, it's important that we focus in in other places, and we've worked with our partners like Events East on uh, institutional procurement, and uh, they've launched a, a local program a couple of months back. They're working with 70 suppliers from every region uh, in Nova Scotia, and will have their local consumption up uh, quite uh, quite significantly. Uh, so it's another lever to, to ensure that we're spreading revenue around the province from uh, institutional procurement as well. Thank you. You have a quick follow-up, right? Yes, MLA Tilly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just wondering if uh, you would be able to table for the committee the breakdown of the cost of Nova Scotia Loyal for us? Not now, but... After the fact, yeah. yeah we won't get that. Thank you, Emily Kerr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
We all realize that lack of internet has been a challenge for years. I'm certainly thankful of Mr. Stevens' work and Jennifer Angel's work and all the staff at Develop Nova Scotia. It's been a game changer in Annapolis and throughout rural Nova Scotia. The current infrastructure challenge that rises to the top is cell service. So if you're looking in Annapolis, for instance, and I know people in Cape Breton are shaking their heads as well up and down or Sheet Harbor, but if you look at Young's Cove or Parker's Cove or Hampton or Margaretsville, and I could list dozens of towns that don't have any cell service, not bad cell service, no cell service. It's an, you know, it's an economic development challenge. It's a health safety challenge. It presents a number of challenges. And I've raised this with the minister. Uh, she's been great talking in private. I've raised it on the floor of the legislature last year. And as I remember, there were a few chuckles, and the context being it wasn't laughing because we thought it was funny. It was all of us can appreciate that this is a real problem. Um, and there's a perfect storm, and we're not here to discuss health concerns with you, but you know, there's a perfect storm of um, I've got six hours of emergency service in Annapolis County, um, and I have <clears throat> people that can't use their cell phone to call 911 even though that's what they're being told to do. So I guess my real push would be as a rural MLA um, pushing for or is there a future mandate or projected mandate if we come under budget at Develop Nova Scotia? Is there more work to be done that would see cell towers be uh, uh, erected throughout the province in Annapolis and uh, I guess if Mr. Stevens, if you could comment any detail you have that I could take back to people of Annapolis, that'd be great. Thank you. Before I recognize Mr. Stevens, I just want to remind committee witnesses and speakers, uh, or committee members, that the topic is post-COVID economic development, right? So just, just to stay there, Mr. Stevens, thank you. Emily Kerr. Mr. Chair, and I certainly appreciate that. My concern is recruiting healthcare professionals, no cell service. Recruiting for any economic development, just the, the parallel at the same time is that health safety concern. Thank you. Thank you, Emily Kerr. Mr. Stevens. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's no question that uh, cell service in uh, a great uh, part of Nova Scotia is inadequate. Um, one of the enabling pieces uh, to, uh, to, to feed those towers is the fiber network that is being built out um, through the internet project. So um, the, you know, what we're trying to ensure is that what we're doing today is going to help us uh, in the future. Uh, this past um, year we uh, did do a cell gap study um, with a consultant. Uh, they've um, probably confirmed what many of you have experienced, that there are significant gaps uh, in the province. Um, we've been uh, you know, looking at how do we, how do we address that, because it's unlike the internet um, challenge where it was really market failure of reaching an in individual household, um, with cellular service, uh, simply putting up more towers typically doesn't add more customers to uh, to a provider so there needs to be a, a different a different model to um, to address that concern um, we've been uh, working with the, the department and with emergency management to ensure that the um, the study that was undertaken is is thorough and and covers um, as many of the concerns as possible um, and at this point uh, it's really uh, waiting on a mandate to to address that, whether it be uh, Build Nova Scotia or emergency management or some other uh, um, area of the government. But um, yeah, it's 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 certainly a concern um, that we've all experienced. Uh, brief follow up, Emily Kerr. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Everyone else is going for it, so thank you, Mr. Stevens. So, with a projected mandate, um, is there a chance to? table the cell gap study or get our hands on it to look at it? Mr. Stevens. Uh, I will have to check into that to see what the, the confidentiality on it is, but um, uh, yeah, perhaps Deputy Farmer can speak to that as well. Emily Palmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think some of my colleagues have 
some of the same concerns or, or uh, notes that we have on this side of the table on a few things. But um, I was going to ask a question about the loyal program uh, and the, uh, the consultation process. You've, you've, you've talked a little bit about that. So maybe I'll shift gears a little bit. And if, if you want to maybe elaborate on some of that uh, in your answer. Uh, but I'm curious about any consultations and feedback uh, from those who are most impacted as a result of COVID-19. Um, could you tell us a bit more about the ways you're involving business owners uh, and entrepreneurs in discussions about how initiatives uh, with their, for their businesses and what solutions are available to them? Deputy Minister Farmer. Yeah, thank you. So <clears throat> if, I, if I start with COVID-19 uh, and um, the support programs that we ran throughout, uh, those were all built in consultation with the business community in, in the province. Many will be familiar and some may have participated in the Nova Scotia Business Labour Economic Coalition calls, shortened to NESBLEC uh, by some, uh, that, that took place. And at the peak of COVID, those were happening three times, three times a week. At other times, they were, they were weekly, but it was a forum for uh, business organizations, governments of all levels uh, to be in one place to, to really understand where the needs and the gaps were because there was federal uh, programming, certainly like the wage subsidy and the rent subsidy, uh, but inevitably there were, there were gaps as well. And so that was a, a good forum in addition to direct consultations that took place with business groups as to, as to where the needs were. Uh, in designing some of the programs that were specific to you know business types that were affected by public health restrictions, there was a lot of discussion about if we had a formula that looked like this, what would be the impact to avoid unintended uh, consequences? And we worked with restaurants, Nova Scotia and Restaurants Association of of Canada as an example, and when we were doing that, when we were doing the design. Um, in terms of other programming, we always do a better job when we when we do it in consultation with uh, with business. The IRP program that we touched on earlier was uh, something that uh, came from consultations that took place across the province with businesses of all all sizes, uh, and was introduced to address that gap that exists for capital spending or existed for capital spending below uh, fifteen uh, million dollars. Uh, the minister, uh, since uh, she's she's uh, taken on uh, her role, has met with businesses of all sizes uh, around the province, and we continue to talk to them about their needs and challenges. We touched on labor as a uh, as a challenge, and that continues to be uh, a challenge, of course. Uh, we've also talked about what other uh, programming uh, is helpful, and the most recent support program that we rolled out was the Small Business Hurricane Relief uh, Program. And when we, you know, consulted with with businesses and uh, some organizations quickly because we wanted to get it out the door quickly, cash flow was was really the the main driver there. We certainly couldn't replace. Uh, lost revenue uh, completely or deal with insurance deductibles completely but we could make sure that there was some cash flow that was available and and so that was how that was uh, designed but we always do a better job uh, when we make policy decisions that are informed by those who are affected by those policy decisions clearly Emily Palmer uh, so thank you very much for that um, and just to follow up quickly just to just to Go back to the loyal program. The consultation process. We just talked about consultation, and uh, you gave a detailed answer on that. Uh, could you elaborate any more on the consultation process and uh, maybe the takeaways that you've got from the consultation process for the loyal program? Sure. Thank you, Deputy Minister Farmer. Thank you. Uh, so, for the for the the program design elements of it, uh, we had a, a team that was present at farmers markets small retailers, large retailers uh, across the province. And so uh, while they were talking to consumers and consumers were participating in a prototyping exercise, there were also conversations that were had with the business owners. And uh, we know for this program to be successful that it's going to need to be easy to implement for uh, the business owner. It's going to be easy for the, it needs to be easy for the consumer uh, to participate in. Uh, we we heard a lot about what kinds of uh, rewards were more compelling and what 
what kinds of collection mechanisms were easier or harder uh, for, the, uh, for, the, for the particular businesses. We learned that people who attend a farmer's market look at buying local differently than people who buy in a big box store, as an example. Not surprising, but certainly validated uh, through the research. On, on the brand engagement side of things, it's been more at a consumer level than it's been at a, uh, at a business level. Uh, and it's, it's been around what really resonates with them and what motivates them to, to buy local, all of which will inform the ultimate design of the, of the full-scale program. MLA Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Lots of great conversation. Just wanted to certainly share the sentiments about the comments on the cost of living and how everything is costing more and uh, how we're, we take a lot of criticism from the opposition. It's their job to say that we're not doing things, that, doing enough. Um, but there's a laundry list of supports that we've put out to try and help people. But we all know that what's not going to help folks is in the spring when the federal liberal carbon tax comes in and adds more to the price of fuel. Um, with that being said, I want to turn to uh, Mr. Farmer to talk about the regional enterprise networks. I don't know much about those. Can you share what you can with them, with us about them? Uh, Deputy Minister Farmer. Thank you. I often move too quickly for the light, so I apologize for that. Um, so the, the regional enterprise uh, networks are uh, organizations around the province that um, are, are partnerships between the province and often uh, several, <coughs> excuse me, several municipal uh, units. Uh, there's there's two in Cape Breton that work closely together with the Cape Breton uh, under the Cape Breton partnership. Uh, there's the Cumberland Business Connector, the Pictou County Partnership, the Truro and Colchester Wren, the Valley Wren, the Western Wren, and then there's arrangement with uh, East Hans in a partnership they have with the with the Halifax Partnership. And they run a variety of, uh, of different programs. Uh, some are common across the regional enterprise networks. Some are specific uh, in, in regions. Uh, one of the common uh, programs is called Business Now, so it's uh, advising for a small business uh, and connecting them to the various programs, whether they be provincial or, or federal uh, programs that might be available. There's a, a virtual advisor uh, program that connects businesses to uh, advisors that uh, they, they may need access to on a, uh, a short-term limited time basis but particular expertise in in their business um, they uh, work with um, small businesses to uh, bridge programs uh, from the province so as an example when we were doing the COVID 19 workplace screening the wrens were a critical partner uh, to get those uh, test kits available in uh, in communities and then they do some interesting uh, things uh, you know not necessarily across the board but uh, at an individual level so the, the western wren uh, for example has a succession program where they're helping businesses that are planning uh, to, uh, you know, the owners are planning to retire and move on, help them to identify potential future purchasers and arrange financing and, and make, those, uh, make those kinds of uh, connections. Uh, they've also been, an, you know, an excellent partner for uh, Develop Nova Scotia as, um, you know, local uh, placemaking uh, projects have been uh, undertaken and uh, they they're a partner with labor skills and immigration as well um, to help with the settlement of, of people in communities and of course uh, to uh, connect employers to the Atlantic immigration pilot and, and otherwise so essentially a, a partner on the ground for economic development labor skills and immigration and in some cases a COA and other departments as well. Thank you, Deputy Minister. Uh, Emily Boudreau. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I'll, I'll probably go off of topic a little bit here before I get to my question. But we talked a lot about grants in our in our in our um, MLA offices, and we've we filled out lots. And we, you know, we're very proud of our seniors' care grant. But one of the surprises for me was the federal government had announced a $500 grant for seniors last year. And what was coming at my office this year was that that grant put them a, a number of uh, seniors over the threshold and impacted their old AS. 
Emily Lachance. Sorry. I'm not Terry. Um, I guess I would just really encourage folks to, um, I mean, I think the questions are not to us and the discussion is not directed to us. The questions are to the witnesses and I think there's been quite a few folks who have engaged in some lengthy preambles um, and at the same time we're running out of time for questioning. So I guess I would just encourage folks to really uh, focus, well, comments about like the carbon tax that wasn't actually linked to a question and, and, and MLA Tilly, although I appreciate your comments, um, a long preamble. Like we, we need the time for questions and answers, not, not for making speeches. Thank you, Emily Chance. I would allow the preamble slightly, at least. It is related to the topic, so, but I would ask you to keep it short. We are running out of time. Emily Boudreaux. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, and I won't uh, belabor it much more other than to say that, you know, I'm very proud that our Seniors Care Grant did not impact seniors in our community that same way. So I'll move on to kind of something that everybody here has probably heard me talk about in the legislature and I'm excited about green my, hydrogen? yes, absolutely, green hydrogen and offshore wind in the Strait of Kent. So there's a lot of buzz going around about that. And, and I just wanted to kind of ask the Deputy Minister Farmer just about kind of when, when those types of things come to, you know, the, that hype comes to, you know, you know, rural communities like the Strait of Kent. So like, how does that do those developments attract other businesses to the community? How does that, how do you see the economic development impact of those types of um, opportunities for for regions like the Strait of Canso and Richmond in particular? Deputy Minister Farmer. Yeah, thank thank you for the question. Um, you know, there, there's uh, certain things that become magnets uh, for for economic activity. Uh, so there's uh, there's a lot of uh, businesses in our province of, of all sizes, uh, but there's certain really significant developments that uh, have a um, I'll call it a rocket booster uh, effect. So Irving Shipbuilding, all of the spin-off that comes uh, with Irving Shipbuilding, whether it is for uh, people doing uh, catering or uh, you know supplying uh, fabricated uh, parts and, and, and everything in between uh, there's there's a tremendous spin-off that goes with that if you look at um, Michelin 3,500 direct jobs uh, in the province but an awful lot of suppliers that benefit from the presence of, of Michelin and our finance and Treasury Board colleagues have uh, detailed uh, modeling that they will do to be able to say uh, here's the direct impact, but here's the, the spin-off impact of that. And when we think about the prospects of, of green hydrogen for uh, the, the Strait region in particular is where, where most of the interest is, is focused, um, it has the potential to be a, you know, a game changer for the province. These are billion dollar uh, investments when you're, when you're talking about uh, you know, building a plant. So that has uh, implications for everybody that's in the construction uh, supply chain uh, in the province. It has the prospect for uh, attracting uh, new people to the province because there's there's going to be some unique uh, skills that will be necessary. It creates opportunity, uh, and uh, you know we will work with the Nova Scotia Community College as an example to make sure that there's programming in place that helps people prepare for the the job opportunities that are, go are going to be there as this uh, as this unfolds. In fact, it's one of the unique strengths we have in Nova Scotia is the ability to to partner with uh, such a good uh, and practical financial or uh, educational institution. Uh, that uh, that can be responsive uh, to the needs of, uh, of industry um, you know right down to the um, you know the, the local businesses that will uh, thrive through a construction period and then a period where there are, are people who are earning a good wage working uh, in that in that industry so um, when you get to a certain scale, the spin-off is significant, uh, and uh, any one of the projects would be substantial. If we have more than one green hydrogen project that uh, that comes to fruition, uh, that will be uh, that will be a multiplier. But in in so many ways, <clears throat> it's our time uh, in this uh, in in this province. Uh, you know, when geography uh, used to matter more than it does, uh, that was a, a disadvantage uh, for us. You can work uh, in Toronto and live in 
Liverpool, Nova Scotia, uh, and there's people who are who are doing that. Geography isn't the disadvantage that it was. Um, we've got a tremendous wind resource, uh, and as the the focus on renewable energy uh, grows, um, that becomes a tremendous uh, asset for us. And you know, we've seen some really significant uh, wins of late. I could talk a lot about the. Um, innovation ecosystem that exists in the province, but I'll, I'll just say that the announcement the other day that HRM will be Canada's uh, site for the Defence Innovation Accelerator for the North Atlantic, uh, subject to you know NATO agreeing to that, but it's it's Canada's nominee um, it is going to be a significant driver uh, as well, and it's premised on assets we have like. Cove and Volta and all of the research facilities that we have there. So it's an exciting time uh, for the province and uh, it, it will be important that everybody feels the benefit of that. Thank you. Emily Burrell. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to co come back to the, the practical question of the affordability of rural internet. And perhaps uh, Mr. Farmer, Mr. Stevens, either of you might be able to comment about I want to ask particularly about the satellite internet program. Um, it, uh, the money that's available for subsidy is on the installation end. Uh, and we know that people that are in those places that can only be reached that way, they end up with a monthly fee of around 140 or so, and we know that's a, a lot more than, uh, than others are paying. Uh, is any consideration being given uh, in, in light of this, this fact that uh, effective access requires a price point that's real? Uh, is any consideration being given uh, to directing some subsidy uh, towards lowering that 140 figure? And, 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 and if not, isn't it coming time that maybe it should be? If either of you could respond. Yeah. Deputy Minister Farmer? Yeah, what, what I can say is that the program as designed is uh, strictly for the, the installation. So $1,000 is roughly the the cost of the of the hardware up front. It's not directed to the, the ongoing costs. Um, and it's funded through the Internet for Nova Scotia Trust um, that operate within a, a, a trust indenture and are, are limited. So uh, the trust wouldn't have the, the latitude uh, under its um, uh, under its mandate to address the the monthly recurring uh, charge. Uh, that would be uh, have to be a, a program unto itself. Um, to my knowledge, there's no uh, plans around a, a, a program that looks like that. Uh, we have uh, done work with uh, a, a nonprofit organization called GEO, Getting Everyone Online, which you're familiar with, uh, that does excellent work to uh, help um, lower income uh, persons access uh, internet services and associated uh, hardware. Uh, I would anticipate that if you talk to them, they would say that they could fulfill a larger, um, a, a larger set of subscribers as users than than they have uh, now. But uh, as far as the satellite program uh, goes, there's there's not any element of it that is a subsidy on the monthly recurring. Thank you, Emily Lachance, with just over five minutes left for questioning. Great, thank you. Um, I wanted to return to the question of um, the lack of an economic development plan um, and, uh, you know, because I think that in the House, the Minister actually gave three different answers to the question of what's, you know, what's in the plan. The plan was immigration, NS Loyal and the MOST program. You talked about ICT jobs and green hydrogen. Um, you know, and if we went into mandate letters, we'd see lots about the better paycheck guarantee, which, you know, no one has said anything about. Um, and so I'm wondering, so I actually really do think the lack of a plan is a problem. Um, it doesn't take into account consultation with people, it doesn't offer metrics. So I'm wondering without that plan, um, how the department, um, what lenses the department uses in decision making about developing programs. So gender, for instance, I'm wondering how that's taken into account when we talk about some of these jobs like the NATO unit, the green hydrogen development. Um, how does sustainability get accounted for? And how does cost of, like, how does contributing to the cost of living crisis and to the well-being of, of, of all Nova Scotians? Because I think you made reference to spreading benefits across sectors, but, you know, it, you know trickle down doesn't work. So, so I'm wondering what lenses you use in decision making. Deputy Minister Farmer. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So, um, 
I'll, I'll go back to sort of the sort of the four headings that I, I talked about, and and that's often the way that we talk about um, you know the priorities around um, uh, growing the. Um, most productive, highest paying uh, sectors, helping every sector to become more productive, growing our innovation uh, uh, ecosystem that we have in the province and really uh, setting the table for um, having the jobs of the, of the future and then uh, spreading, spreading the benefit around. Um, within each of those, you can, you can map certain programming to that. So when we talk about um, growing the higher paying sectors, what we use our payroll rebate as a, as a, as a tool, for example, that gets used uh, to grow the, the top end sectors. We uh, help productivity as an example through the innovation uh, rebate program, which has a sustainability uh, lens to it. So um, it's, it's looking for projects that are not only driving productivity, but are uh, enhancing environmental outcomes. When we talk about the, the innovation ecosystem, um, you know, one of the things that we've got, we've had a real focus on there is how do we ensure that there is access for underrepresented uh, groups. So um, when we work with Volta, as an example, that's some of the reporting, um, how many of the founders are from traditionally underrepresented groups, what percentage of the uh, cohort is uh, our female-led uh, companies. As an example, um, the, the province through Innovacor has an uh, investment in Sandpiper Ventures, which is a women-led venture capital fund. Uh, it's been extraordinarily successful. Um, the, the data would say that uh, women-led venture capital funds uh, on uh, on average are more successful, uh, yet only a very small percentage of company founders are uh, female-led and fewer venture capital funds are, are female-led. So we're, we're, we're very proud to be supporting that um, through, uh, through Innovacor. When we talk about uh, how do we ensure that we have a local uh, impact, uh, a lot of that is through uh, you know, partnerships that we have around uh, the province. Um, we've got an excellent partnership, as an example, with uh, Futurepreneur. Uh, we've got an excellent partnership with, uh, with Mashup Labs. And in both of those cases, in our uh, contribution arrangements uh, with them, a part of their programming is focused on um, uh, African Nova Scotian or uh, Indigenous uh, clients. And we look for that in those, uh, in those partnership agreements. One of the organizations that we're really, uh, uh, really proud to work with and, and many will be familiar with is Ignite Labs. Uh, they've got a location in, uh, in Yarmouth and, and one in New Glasgow. And uh, we were uh, really pleased to uh, be part of a program that they ran this summer. It was uh, uh, led by a, um, uh, a young varsity athlete from uh, St. FX, Aaliyah Frazier was her name, African Nova Scotian, uh, started a program for uh, youth uh, to learn about science and sports. So part of the day was a uh, half-day science program, partnered with the Discovery Center. Part of the day was a half-day sports program, partnered with St. FX Basketball and the Halifax Wanderers. Uh, and we had 40 kids Order. who had a great time. The time for witness questioning has come to an end. I would ask each of you if you want to give us a very brief closing remark. <laughs> I would let you go ahead with that. Mayor McDougall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I just want to quickly touch on three quick points in my closing remarks. Um, so number one, during COVID, the entire planet got to take a break, take a breath, and start healing a little bit from the environment, environmental catastrophe that is you know, human impact. And we saw what happens when we reduce our carbon output, when we reduce um, our traveling and our impact on the environment. And I think that's something that we really have to keep focusing on as we talk about recovery. How do we always have this lens of climate resiliency top of mind as we're recovering and growing our communities, strengthening our economy? Because there are things we should be thinking about, like transit, investment in moving many people in 
fewer vehicles, investment in active transportation. What do we do with old rail lines that are, you know, no good to anybody else but could be enormously beneficial to active transportation trails and connectivity between our communities? Um, that also would lead into where do we put housing? How do we make sure that the housing that is being developed and invested in to support our, gr our growing communities um, don't negatively impact our watersheds? Don't take away from the important old growth urban forests and trees that we have that are very, very important to decreasing the impacts of flooding. All of this needs to be taken into account, and I know they're not huge budget lines, but things like investing in rain gardens and that will help <clears throat> support our stormwater sewers when they're inundated with heavy rainfall amounts in short, short periods of time. All of this to say we, we, you, we can't do this alone as, as separate levels of government. We really do need to focus on that intergovernmental relationship between municipal, provincial, and federal governments Coming together, you know, to have this conversation at the committee level is wonderful, but to have regular coming together of various levels of government to talk about, okay, what is your strategic vision? What are your plans? What are your investments going forward? And how can we collaborate with one another and all be at that same table instead of being surprised through, say, legislation or decision making through budgets? Um, I just, I hope that that, that spirit of collaboration is always, always top of mind because we can we, we saw during COVID with the relief funding and how wonderfully we all came together as various levels of government, how we can do really, really good work that impacts everybody separately, just a disaster. Thank you. Anyone else a closing remarks? Ms. Lutz? Thank you. I would just note, so we spent years before COVID in equal infrastructure equilibrium and the disruptor that has been COVID is hugely impactful. So I would encourage you all to remember just because it's underground and you can't see it does not mean it is one of the most crucial pieces to solving one of the biggest problems facing our community. And if you have developers ready to go with plans and beautiful developments, but your municipality does not have, is not prepared, does not have the resources to, to supply the infrastructure to support that development, or to even know if they have the infrastructure capacity to support that development, that is a huge problem. Economies of scale with municipalities would help this. It, regionalization would kick us into high gear and allow us to reach our potential, and that doesn't have to mean loss of local representation. I think that's a huge piece of it. It does not have to mean a loss of local representation, but it would allow us to really move at a lightning pace, and currently we are not moving at a lightning pace. Um, you know, the next biggest challenge after housing is, as we've talked about, um, labor. And that is intimately also tied to the care economy. So without childcare, young people cannot get back to work to replace our workforce that is retiring. Um, and women are disproportionately affected by this when people can't go back to work. CCAs and ECEs are, we've done great work in supporting them to, to have a better wage, but they still make half of what a plumber makes or someone in construction makes, and that's a real issue. That is a real issue that we have is that we don't value the, the work of caring for people. It's not only a moral imperative, but it is essential to our economy functioning. So that's, you know, that's another way of looking at it. And it's also, um, it's, it creates an equilibrium between uh, folks in our society. That's not fair. Um, and finally, I would just say in talking about recovery, um, I would encourage the committee to look at what was broken to begin with and, and what has gotten better through COVID and what has gotten worse. And also, to encourage you to look at the data on quality of life from in Engage Nova Scotia. They actively measure with real numbers, real data, how rural, rural areas are doing compared to urban areas in this province. <laughs> and that municipalities are very willing partners in helping you solve your challenges, helping you meet your priorities, help us get to doubling the population or whatever types of priorities the province has. Municipalities are here to support you, um, but we have to be at the table. We have to be empowered to uh, to do the work. And there are act there are very small changes that the provincial government can make. There are big ones too, uh, but there are also very small changes that can be made to make our ability to do good work for our citizens much easier. Thank you for having me here today. Thank you, Ms. Lutz. Either of you gentlemen have closing remarks? Other than to thank the committee for the questions. Deputy Minister Farmer? I'd just like to thank the committee for the questions and the opportunity to join you today. Thank you. And Mr. Stevens? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I would like to thank the committee and uh, I would echo uh, Mayor McDougall's comments. One of the 
as, as bad as COVID was in many regards, one of the, the best things that came out of it was the level of collaboration that we have uh, within between levels of government, within uh, various members of the community, and, and I'm very, very proud of the work that Develop Nova Scotia did in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate you, committee members, or the, sorry, the witnesses coming in. Thank you very much. Some excellent information. I'm sure everybody agrees. We had some great opportunity to listen to you. I would ask you to please leave. <laughs> I don't know how to say it politely. Thank you very much. We do have a lot of business to do in a short time. Thank you. Yeah, two minute recess. That's two minutes, literally. Call the meeting to order again. Order, please. So in the agenda setting, I think the agenda setting is going to take a few minutes, so if you guys don't mind, I would like to move ahead to setting the date for the next meeting. The next meeting is scheduled for December 27th, which I don't think anybody wants to be here for, right? So the clerk has indicated that dates available will be Thursday the 15th, or Tuesday the 20th before Veterans Affairs. If that one happens, it has to be 10 o'clock till noon. Any preference on that? December 15th or December 20th? If it's December 20th, it has to be between the hours of 10 and noon. If it's the 15th, it'll be between 1 and 3. Twenty, twenty. You guys okay with 20? All right, so it'll be, so the next meeting will be December 20th between the hours of 10 and noon. Okay, agenda setting. Uh, I recognize Emily Boudreau. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if we're going to go through each individual one, I can I can kind of go through our, our topics and um, uh, individually. So um, we, we I think all members have our three topics uh, that we're interested in, and I would move that the first topic for the PPC caucus be the provincial government investment in the Verushin, um Center, and the witnesses include. Um, Scott Farmer, Deputy Minister of the Department of Economic Development, and Dr. Beth Mason, a representative from the Verschuren Center. Any uh, discussion? So you heard the motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Contramine? 
Motion approved. MLA Boudreau. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, secondly, I would move that the second topic for the PC caucus be Nova Scotia's clean renewable energy sector, including green hydrogen production and offshore wind, so shockingly. And the witnesses being Associate Deputy Minister or Deputy Minister of the Department of Environment and Climate Change, a representative from the Department of Natural Resources and Renewable, and Michael Blanche Frauer, who is the Vice President of Strategic Marketing and Sales for NSBI at this point. Any discussion? So you heard the motion. All in favor? Aye. Contra mine? Motion approved. Emily Boudreau. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And finally, I move that the third topic for the PC caucus be innovation rebate program, with the witnesses being Peter McCaskill, the COO of NSBI, and Scott Farmer, Deputy Minister of the Department of Economic Development. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Motion approved. Not contra mine, no. <laughs> Motion approved. <laughs> Emily Kerr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So on behalf of the Liberal Caucus, I move to add the following topics uh, for future consideration. One being the success and future of Nova Scotia's Green Fund. Uh, witnesses we uh, would like to see or, or speak to or hear from are Deputy Minister of Department of Environment and Climate Change, the President and CEO of Efficiency One, Stephen McDonald, and the President and CEO of Clean Foundation, Scott Skinner. Any discussion? Yes. Emily Smith. Thank you. We appreciate this topic. Um, we're not going to support it as it's presented. Wondering if um, if you would consider changing it to the future of the Nova Scotia Climate Change Fund, because uh, the the Green Fund is is no longer. Um, there is an opportunity to discuss the Green Fund coming up at public accounts, and we feel it's more appropriate to to be discussed there. Emily Kerr? Yeah, uh, no, I appreciate the comments, uh, MLA Smith, but we'd like to have that, that topic if we could be, so. Emily Smith? Unfortunately, we're not gonna, we're not gonna support it, but the Auditor General's doing a, a study, a report on the climate change, the Green Fund, that's coming up on the 28th of February, so there'll be ample time to discuss it uh, and look at the past performance of the Green Fund and we're excited for the future of the Nova Scotia Climate Change Fund. Emily Kerr. I have no more comment on that, but I could introduce other topics. We, we, we want to present that, and maybe we'll have to vote on that, I guess. So, yeah. so the motion is for the success and future of Nova Scotia's Green Fund. With the witness you mentioned? Sorry, I said the motion is for the success and future of Nova Scotia's Green Fund. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. No. Contra mine? Yay. Motion declined. Emily Kerr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We'd like to present a second topic, as you can read in front of you, the impact of inflation, the labor shortage on Nova Scotia and business. Uh, we're asking to hear from the representative from the Department of Economic Development, a representative from the Department of Labor, Skills and Immigration, representative for the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, a representative from Invest Nova Scotia and a representative from the Atlantic Chamber of Commerce. Discussion? Uh, Emily Smith, uh, Palmer? Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, our side of the table feels this is a, a, an excellent topic uh, for discussion and uh, we'll be supporting this. So you heard the motion, all in favor? Signify by aye. Aye. Contra mine? Motion approved. Do you have another topic? Okay, okay.
MLA Kerr. Thank you. Welcome back. Uh, maybe I could ask MLA Smith, um, would uh, your side consider uh, with the same witnesses uh, looking at the success and future of the new fund, the Green Fund is segued into? We certainly have other topics, but we'd like to find a, some middle ground there. Emily Smith? Well, I'll, I'll have to consult, obviously, but uh, my, my thought is that the Green Fund is no longer, right? Like, we passed legislation that it's, it's gone. It's a, it's a public account that can, be re can and will be reviewed at public accounts. We're excited for the future of the Nova Scotia Climate Change Fund. So what I wouldn't want to see happen is we get the witnesses here and then questions start going to them about the Green Fund when that's going to be talked about at PAC. Um, but again, I, I, yeah, I mean, we're, we are short on time. If I can ask for 30 seconds, Mr. Chair, to consult with my colleagues. Yes, please, with Fear of the injury. So would you like to make the amended motion? Emily Kerr? Yeah, so I'd like to make a motion to the success and future of the Nova Scotia Climate Change Fund. Uh, with the witnesses listed as Deputy Minister of uh, Department of Environment, Climate, uh, Climate Change, President CEO of Efficiency One, Stephen McDonald, President CEO of Clean Foundation, Scott Skinner. Thank you. You heard the motion. All in favor signify by aye. Aye. Contramine? Motion approved. MLA Lachance? Um, I just wanted to ask a question, so um, just to make sure I'm understanding correctly. So we didn't talk about the blue economy. You're proposing two of the three to bring forward. We are proposing two of the three, just because we found a lot of similarities between uh, this and what they yeah. brought forward. Okay. So we, 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 right. So we triaged it that way. Okay. All right. Yeah. But feel free. <laughs> Emily Burrow. So on, uh, on behalf of our caucus, I'd like to uh, uh, move uh, first that uh, uh, we bring forward the topic of open pit mining in Nova Scotia with the uh, uh, witnesses as are named here. You heard the motion in discussion? Yes. Emily Smith. Uh, we, we won't be supporting uh, this topic. Um, this committee is about developing our economic economic development uh, and um, we're easily we're worried that this could easily identify companies that could have market implications so uh, for that reason we will not be supporting this topic Emily Burrow well I, I, I would wish to say for the record that uh, that we would ignore a, a subject under the heading of an economic development committee because it has market conditions, uh, market uh, implications. It's ridiculous. Uh, uh, open pit mining in Nova Scotia is a very important uh, economic development consideration uh, and uh, we will certainly uh, uh, vociferously oppose the government's opposition to our bringing forward this subject. Any more discussion? Do you want to vote on it? Yep. All in favor signify by aye. Contramine? Yeah. Motion declined. I vote no. Uh, Emily Burrow? Second point? Yep. Uh, so the uh, other subject we would wish to bring forward, challenges in the agricultural sector with the witnesses as listed uh, in, in, the, uh, in this document. Thank you. Emily Palmer. Thanks, Chair. And uh, I want to thank my colleague for bringing the topic about agricultural forward, but uh, it, uh, it does seem to be a topic that I think we would be willing to uh, have a good conversation about. But I do wonder if there's a, any way that you might be willing to narrow it down, the topic of discussion, or is there a focus 
that you were considering on this that you could uh, elaborate on for consideration? MLA Lachance, you have four minutes left. Okay, um, uh, I'm under the gun this, this meeting. Um, I mean, I guess I would think of sort of the confluence of uh, the cost, like the, the increased cost inflationary impacts sort of where we go from now with the, with the agricultural sector. You know, we've, we've, this will be after the harvest of 2022, which, you know, a lot of folks were concerned about. So I think a time to take stock. And if I maybe, oh, sorry. sorry, MLA Palmer. Thank you, Chair. Uh, if I could just uh, have a friendly suggestion to uh, possibly add the Executive Director of the Nova Scotia uh, Federation of Agriculture. I don't have their name with, with me, uh, but uh, to accompany Mr. Marsh, possibly. The, yeah. Okay. So the motion is for challenges in agriculture and sector uh, with the addition of the Executive Director of NSFA. All in favor signify by aye. Aye. Contrabine? Motion approved. MLA Burrell? So, so just to, to register uh, for the record that we will at a future meeting be bringing back a proposed second uh, subject and uh, topic and hope to be able to get the committee's agreement to it. Thank you. Uh, Emily Boudreau. Yeah, yeah, just for clarification, my understanding for, for this committee is that it was a three, three topics for the, the, the PC party, two for the Liberal and one for the NDP. So I just wanted to, we, we've approved one, so I, I just wanted to get some clarification on that. Emily Boudreau, or Burrell? Uh, yes, the member's right. I wasn't going to correct you. <laughs> I was going to let you go. <laughs> so we're moving to correspondence. We only have a few more minutes. So correspondence from Chris Trotter, you guys, you folks have all had it out. It was in relation to Mark, uh, Matt Parker's presentation. Is there any discussion on that? Emily Smith? I don't really wish to discuss, but uh, can we make sure that the Department of Natural Resources has a copy of that correspondence as well? Sure will. The uh, meeting with Mr. Hugh Aranka Davies. I know some folks had, apparently some folks, you go folks had conversation with him. Is there any discussion you want to share on that? Moving forward. Uh, Follow-up information for Peter Geddes. Any conversation on that? No. The annual report, approval of annual report. Can we have a motion to approve the annual report? A motion by Emily Palmer to approve the annual report. All in favor? Aye. Contramine? Motion approved. And that brings to an end our meeting. Thank you very much, gentlemen, ladies.